we are going to learn a lot and we are going uh, to interact a lot with each other and therefore you are most welcomed. Maybe I can begin by introducing myself. I'm Dr. Rebecca Wambua. Uh, I have 18 years of uh, teaching experience at the school level and 14, 14 years of experience teaching at the university. And as I interact with students, as I interact with teachers, I've realized mental health issues are a big concern, not only to us as teachers, but also to parents and also the children. So mental health issues cut across all age brackets and also all kinds of status of life, whether one is in low class, middle class or upper class. They affect all of us in the community. And when you look at some of the statistics that uh, we read through newspapers, through research, uh, especially during the pandemic, many families were affected by mental health issues. And some statistics show that one out of four people suffer from mental illness in Kenya, while others also show a, a higher figure that 65% of Kenyans are suffering from mental health issues. And that is why this is an area of concern. And that is why we call for this meeting so that we can be able to deliberate and see what the way forward is so that we assist some of us because we may know a child, we know, may know a parent, a father, a mother, a relative, or a neighbor who is affected by mental health issues. And that is why this meeting is of great importance to all of us. And a number of us are asking whether we'll be able to record the session. Uh, the session will be recorded. Can you let me? Yes. Carol, Caroline, you can mute. You can mute so that uh, we are not disturbed. Are you able to hear me? Victor, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. I will do that. We are okay. hearing you. We can hear you, Dr. Oh, okay. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Okay, so mental health issues are a great concern, and that is why we are here from different backgrounds. Some are teachers lawyers, medic, we also have them here. So at the end of it, we want to see what is the way forward uh, for, uh, for Kenya, especially, whether it is in the working environment, school environment, home environment. So we'll be having these serious deliberations. And I thank you so much for sparing time even to come and be with us. I can see already a number of us were logged in half an hour to time and that shows how important uh, this session is. So for the sake of future uh, engagements, uh, we are going to record because some would like uh, their colleagues to hear about this meeting or what was discussed because they are not able to attend due to one reason or another. And therefore we are recording this session and I have a YouTube channel that I'll give you details. So after this session, we are going to post the meeting or the recordings of the meeting in the YouTube so that people can have access and that they can be helped. So as we begin, I'd like to welcome Delphine. Delphine is a friend of mine. She can lead us in a word of prayer so that we begin the meeting. Welcome, Delphine. Thank you, Dr. Ri. Let's believe for our word. Of, let us bow down for our word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are most honored this evening for bringing us together for this webinar. Thank you for the day. And we believe that you're going to guide us through this evening as we discuss issues on mental illness. God, we thank you for the facilitators, participants, and organizers for this session. And we pray that you are going to guide us throughout the session. And it is in Jesus' name that I pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Thank you for leading us in prayer. So as I've told you, we have a number of speakers, but uh, we are going to make the session very brief and interactive. So each speaker will only take um, a maximum of 10 minutes. And after that, the next speaker will come in. So we'll have back-to-back -back presentations of 10 minutes each. Then at the end, we'll have a time for questions. So uh, you can write your 
your questions either on the chat or somewhere so that during the question and answer time, uh, you are able to ask the questions. So we are going to start with the first presenter and that is uh, Grace Quena. So Grace, I hope you are ready. Gra uh, Grace Quena is a counseling psychologist, a Kenya registered psychiatrist nurse at Mathare National Teaching and Referral Hospital. It is the largest psych psychiatric referral hospital in Kenya. She has worked in this hospital for 17 years. Grace is also a counseling psychologist and a mental health champion and mentor. So welcome Grace. Uh, Grace is going to talk about causes of mental illnesses. So Grace, you have your 10 minutes and I begin counting now. You've made share your screen. Thank you, Dr. Rebecca. Just adjust your, your camera a bit so that we can see your face. My camera? Yeah, we are only seeing the top of your head, so try to. <laughs> okay. And but now... when you start sharing, I think it's okay. You can share. Yeah. Okay. I can share. Yeah. So. As my head is not. It's... And now. Okay, yeah, now we can see your face. You can see me? Yeah. So. Okay, yeah, better. Now we know whom we are talking. <laughs> okay, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Yeah, my name is Grace Kenas, uh, Dr. Rebecca Outside. I work in Madare Hospital. I'm a mental health and psychiatric nurse and a consultant counseling psychologist. I'll be sharing on the causes of mental illness, So there, okay, yeah, there. You can see it? Yes. So first I want to define what mental illness is. And according to the National Alliance of Mental Illnesses, they say that mental illness is a medical conditions that affects a person's thinking, feeling, mood, ability to relate to others, and the daily functioning. The World Health Organization declared that four out of 10 of the reading causes of disability in developing countries are mental disorders. So the common mental disorders treated at Madari, where I work, are as, as follows, schizoaffective spectrum disorders and other psychotic disorders. We have bipolar and related disorders. We have depressive disorders. We have trauma and stress related disorders. We have obsessive compulsive related disorders. We have neurodevelopmental wow. disorders, personality disorders, anxiety disorders, substance-related addictive disorders, postpartum psychosis, and many more that I've not mentioned. So what are the causes of mental disorders? I use the biopsychosocial model, and uh, we have their categories in three categories. We have the biological factors, psychological factors, and social factors. And we say that these factors, according to their timing in relation to the illnesses, can predispose the person's illness, precipitate or perpetuate it. So we start with the predisposing factors. And we say predisposing factors are those factors that exist long before the onset of the illness. We have the biological causes, we have the biochemical, and we talk of the neurotransmitters which everybody has, sometimes there is an imbalance. And uh, when there's an imbalance, one is predisposed to mental illness. We have uh, uh, neurotransmitters such as dopamine, the serotonin, and others. We also have abnormal chemical activities in the endocrine system, such as abnormal secretion of cortisol, which causes anxiety and mood disorders. We also have abnormal brain structures, which could be due to a bad defect or brain injury. We also have uh, genetics. There is always a history of mental illness or mental disorders in the family. One can also have uh, chromosomal abnormalities. This is where we find that uh, one has an extra chromosome apart from the 23 pairs. One has an extra one, and these are the children who suffer from bone syndrome, and later they suffer from intellectual disabilities. Yeah, these factors during pregnancy, 
uh, mothers who abuse substance. The child is prone or is predisposed to mental illness, viral infections in pregnancy, malnutrition, severe emotional stress can also predispose a child to mental illness. During birth or after birth, there could be prematurity. There could be anoxia, that is lack of oxygen in the brain baby during the labor. There could be birth trauma, fetal malnutrition, and culture deprivation. Psychological causes, this is uh, social and psychological factors in infancy and childhood, such as severe psychological trauma, physical and emotional trauma, sexual abuse, early loss of a parent or significant others, fixation in developmental stages, maternal deprivation, and child neglect. We have environmental causes, that is upbringing in a chaotic social environment, functional families, personality traits, death and divorce, abject poverty, feeling of inadequacy, low self-esteem and substance use. We have the social causes like the cultural demands, e.g. the female genital mutilation, wife inheritance. Still in the social causes, we have poverty and child labor, migration and displacement. We have the precipitating factors. These are factors or events that occur shortly before the onset of the disorder and usually appear to have induced it. One of these is diseases such as cerebral tumor, meningitis, cerebral malaria, typhoid fever, uh, COVID-19, the pandemic that we have been experiencing of late, trauma due to head injury, the use of illicit drugs such as heroin, cocaine and marijuana, bereavement or loss of a loved one, exam failure, being jilted, retirement, financial loss, severe emotional stress. Then we have the perpetuating factors. These are factors that delays a disorder after it has begun, therefore delaying the improvement of the symptoms. And these are an adherence to treatment, lack of social support, Stigmatization, civil war, left, refugee status, political instability, high inflation of commodities, malnutrition, lack of follow-up, drugs and substance use, conflict, unemployment, domestic violence, and demands at work. Conclusion, mental disorders can be caused by biological, psychological, and social factors which either predispose the person's illness, Respited or perpetuated. My conclusion is mental illness is preventable and is treatable. We have a slogan in Matar, we say it's okay not to be okay. Hashtag the stigma. Thank you, you all matter. Okay, thank you. Thank you for ending on that positive note that uh, uh, the illness, it can be treated. So thank yes. you. You may stop sharing so that we thank go to you. the next presenter. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Grace. Very brief and straightforward. So we have realized there are so many causes of mental illnesses. So it is upon us to check the history and see what causes the mental illness amongst our friends or ourselves or our children. The next presenter is John Matelong. John Matelong is a counseling psychologist, addiction counselor and mental health advocate with five years of experience in different rehabilitation centers. So he, he mainly works with uh, patients who are going through the rehab, and therefore he has a day-to-day -day experience uh, on handling patients who are affected by this disease. So John Matelong, you are welcome to do your 10-minute presentation. Okay, maybe as he tries to unmute, we can go to the next presenter because of time. Uh, the next presenter is Wairimu Karongo. Wairimu Karongo is a counseling psychologist with the Ministry of Health, deployed in Kemsa. She is highly experienced, having worked in various governmental institutions for the last 27 years in various capacities. She rose from the humble beginning of being a classroom teacher in 1994 to her current position as Deputy Director Psychological Counseling through hard work and keenly listening 
to guidance from her seniors. Wairimo is a member of Kenya Counseling Psychological Association. So Wairimo, you can share. Okay, yeah, we can see your screen, you can go on. Okay, thank you very much. I'll briefly talk about the state of mental wellness among the public servants. I'm Mary Wairimo Karongo. I'm currently working in the Ministry of Health as a counseling psychologist. But uh, because of the ongoing process of uh, redundancies and uh, that is happening in Kemsa, I was sent there by the Ministry of Health to offer psychosocial support because as you know, most of these uh, mental health issues can come about when people are people face loss, loss of job, loss of a loved one, which we are going to look at. So I think I'll, I'll go on with the, with the sharing. You can see what I have from my presentation. That's the outline, general awareness, common mental disorder, management and interventions. And of course you have seen uh, the area speakers have mentioned a lot about this. So I may not really go back to, to them. I will just touch on what has not been mentioned. Uh, mental health has been defined and uh, of course, I had also defined it, so I'll not repeat that. Mental wellness also. Of course, when anyone is not uh, having mental health, or when, it, when someone is not having mental illness or mental disorder, then we can say that they have mental well-being or which is an active or dynamic process of becoming aware and making choices towards a healthy and fulfilling life in different dimensions. So when people, uh, uh, we, can, we can say that it's about how people feel and how they function, both on personal and on social level, and how they evaluate their lives as a whole. Anybody who can do that without any problem, that person, of course, is having mental wellness. And of course, um, in mental illness, when we go, when I go, if I go back to mental illness, we find that there are a wide range of uh, mental illnesses that affect someone's, they will affect the mood, the thinking, the behavior, and these have been tackled. They have been tackled by the past uh, speakers. So I don't think I want to go back to them. I just want to say that um, uh, one thing I want to say about this is that it is clear that there is no health without mental health. So mental health is so important that if you don't have it, all the other aspects of health uh, are, are out of reach for you. So uh, when you look at the you know, general awareness, we can say that half of all mental health conditions start in the early years of age but most cases are undetected and untreated. Of course, uh, even when they are detected, even I, I, I hope most of the participants have seen, most of the people who have mental issues, even in the village, they, people tend to ignore them. People are afraid of them. They, are, they don't interact with them. They, they are tied up, if it is somebody who has a mental health in the family, they are tied up and locked up. And some of them are not even taken to the hospital. But some of these mental health conditions start in the early age. 
And I've said that they are undetected and untreated. Of course, some are detect detected, but still go untreated. On the figures, they are there, we have been given. It is estimated that one in every 10 persons suffer from a common mental disorder. And the number increases to one in every four persons for the ones attending routine outpatient services. So when people go to the hospital for other services, they might, it might be detected that they are suffering from mental health. And this number, the numbers rises from 10 to four. So, sorry, from one in 10 persons to four persons, huh? one to, four. the number increases to one in every four persons for those ones attending routine outpatient services. So you can see the numbers are very high and uh, the public servants, they are not left behind when it comes to mental wellness. Some uh, psychological wellness IDEX among civil servants starts at 39%. And of course 39% is a liberal figure because you know that when you carry out a baseline survey, like the one that was carried to establish this, some people may not answer. People with mental health, uh, usually even adults, they don't come out and say that they have mental health. So it may really, the correct figure may not be known, but uh, we can talk about the 39% that underwent the baseline survey that I'm talking about. Um, the, this data obtained through the baseline survey indicated that public servants are affected as follows. We have those ones that are suffering mental health uh, because of drug and substance use. That is the percentage, 24.4%. Uh, 19.4 percent suffering from stress, family instability causes 14.9 uh, sufferings um, uh, mentally. We have financial difficulties, 9.5 percent. Of course, uh, financial difficulties uh, nowadays. We can even find uh, since COVID, we can say that financial difficulties have have increased because people have lost job, jobs. And when people lo lose jobs, they rely on the few public servants or the few who are having jobs. So you'll find that if it is a public servant, there is a very high dependence uh, ratio. There are a lot of people depending on that salary. So this increases the financial difficulties and therefore the number of people suffering mental illness or mental health issues because of financial difficulties could be higher than the 9.5 that was discovered in the baseline survey. Then we have job stagnation at 7.6, HIV AIDS at 4.6, and uh, terminal illness. So unlike uh, other illnesses where people may visit hospitals at the slightest pain, you find that mental health is very unique. Uh, one, it is hard to diagnose people with the mental health. And two, people shy away from visiting health facilities to seek help. So this then means that people are suffering with these mental illnesses without seeking help. And therefore you find like depression is classified as a silent killer because there are very many people who have uh, depression, but they do not um, they do not seek help. So they are they, these ones have been uh, well tackled by Grace or the common mental disorders. So I may not uh, really go back to them. Uh, these ones I'll not go back to them.
tackled on the cognitive mental disorders and neurodevelopment mental disorders. She also talked about the emotional and behavioral disorders, which are common, which are common in uh, children and adolescents. So all these are, I think I will just leave because they have been tackled. Causes of mental disorders. Maybe I may talk a little bit about this. Causes of mental disorders uh, among the public servants. Uh, the, the, the mental disorders among the public servants are caused by factors such as drugs, alcohol, and uh, other substance dependence on dependency on them. Then we have lack of sleep, overloaded schedules, physical inactivity, poor work-life balance. You know, one need to balance between the work and other things. Then we have other issues that may cause um, mental disorders among the public servant, pessimistic thinking, self criticism of an over analyzing issues, perfectionist. Yes, if somebody is a perfectionist or a workaholic, you find that they can also suffer from mental health because you want things done so perfectly that if that is not done, you will find yourself getting, uh, getting uh, affected. So some of the symptoms, these have also been covered by Grace. Some of the symptoms you will find uh, related to mental illness are the ones I have listed. These are just some of them, but they vary. The symptoms of mental illnesses vary and Grace tackled them very well. So I don't want to do, de delve on them. Uh, she tackled uh, all of them but uh, you may see what happens. There is no concentration. One may suffer depression, fits of rage, confusion. All these are some of the things that happens. Behavioral symptoms, she has covered all of them. So I don't want to go back to them. These are some of the interventions that can be done for mental health. Uh, by seeking uh, psychiatrist treatment. Uh, ment you can visit mental health nurses, occupational therapists, psychologists or counselors, medical social workers. All these personnel are engaged in uh, mental health care. Uh, then there are the policies, policies that are geared towards uh, mental health. And uh, this, this one, this is government initiative to make sure everybody is, uh, is, is uh, everybody is suffering, is not suffering from mental health or everybody is experiencing mental wellness. We have the constitution of Kenya 2010, which states that every person has the right to the highest attainable standards of health, which includes the right to health services. And of course, the right to health services includes mental, includes mental health. Then we have the mental health, uh, Kenya mental health policy. This one is broad, but uh, the public servants borrow a lot from, from, from it in coming up with the interventions as far as mental health is concerned. Then we have the mental, Kenya Mental Health Action Plan. This is the one that has listed on what needs to be done in order to improve mental health among the public servants. And uh, all these, all these, uh, we, okay, this one is an international one, Global Comprehensive Mental Health Action Plan, 2013-2020. And it was arrived at uh, during this resolution, which I have, uh, I have put it there, which called on all member states to develop comprehensive mental health action plans. 
of course, you can see Kenya has developed the action plan. That action plan will cater for mental health uh, which are issues which are increasing. You have seen mental health issues have in increased uh, throughout the country. It is not only the general public, even among the uh, public servants, you have seen even known uh, senior government officers coming out and saying that I suffer from this kind of mental health. So this one is very common. Now, we recently in 2019, there was a task force on mental health, which was uh, led by Dr. Frank Jenga, and they went around the country, they collected, uh, they, they collected information on some of the things that can be done in order to improve mental health. And uh, some of the recommendations that they gave in order to improve mental health among the public. And the public here includes general citizens and the public serv servants. So here, some of the, uh, the, the recommendations of the task force have been listed there in my presentation. They said that there should be a setup. There, there should be a commission, mental wellness and happiness commission. It should be set up. This one is not yet in existence, uh, but we hope that it will be done. The other recommendation was to declare mental illness as a national emergency of epidemic proportions. Once uh, something is declared an emergency, a lot of resources will go to it and a lot of interventions will be done. Then there is to carry out a national mental health survey, carrying out a national mental health survey. This, of course, I believe it will be done by the Ministry of Health. Then there is the fast track, the creation of Madari, as a, that is Madari Hospital, as a, a, a saga that is semi-autonomous government authority. I believe that is in the pipeline. Maybe Grace can uh, give us more input on that, but I believe it is in the pipeline. Then there is also implement a multi-sectoral approach to mental health challenges, provide adequate financing for mental health. Of course, mental health, those, who are, those people who have been to mental health institutions and also to the maybe level four, level five hospitals, you'll find that there, there is no, enough finances that are set aside for mental health. Other illnesses, there are finances, but mental health is a bit um, let down. So we are hoping that with these recommendations, this is going to improve. Then there is also regulate and license all institutions offering health care, including rehabs through the medical practitioners and dentist board. I believe this one is in the pipeline. Then the other recommendation was to amend or repeal specified legal provisions that offend the constitution and acts of parliament. And I believe there was a, there, there is a, something that was signed before the parliament went, went on, uh, on a recess. There is something that was signed, an act of parliament which was uh, repealed on mental health so I believe this was part of what Dr. Frank had recommended with his committee. Then there was a gazette the second week of October as a, a mental health awareness week, develop mental health literacy materials. This one is being done by the Ministry of Health. Follow up on mental health amendment bill. Yes, this is the one I was talking about down there. This one has been done, and I believe the president signed it uh, just the other day. Then involve carers and users of mental health services at all levels for legal and policy development. This one, I believe it's in the pipeline. Decentralize mental health services to health, to the primary health care level. This one has been done because I, there is a task we were doing around the country with the Ministry of Health 
and we visited quite a number of uh, and talked about and talked with those people that are on the grassroots, we found that there is quite a sizable number of mental health personnel in the primary health care levels. So please, wherever you are, you should not suffer. You, if you are having a mental health issue, or maybe your relative is having a mental health issue, they should easily move to the nearest level four or level five hospital, and they will be attended. Then there is to train and recruit mental health professionals. This one is also being done. Then this one was done, was said because in connection with the COVID, on the COVID-19 pandemic, of course this COVID pandemic is still with us, the implementation of the task force, the, the task force recommendations will be an important strategy in the COVID-19 pandemic response and long-term recovery. This is because uh, you saw what happened when we went on lockdown, a lot of jobs were lost. Most of, people, most of the people were mentally unstable. Even those who had jobs like the public servants, they are not used to staying home for all the years or for all the months. Some became uh, mentally unstable because of that. And uh, that is why there, there is supposed to be a, 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 a response on the long-term recovery as far as COVID pandemic. And of course, other pandemics, because we don't know, maybe next time we'll have another pandemic. So there are easy ways of reducing mental illness and mental stress. These are just easy, anyone can do this. Balanced diet, avoid smoking, alcohol and other drugs, exercise, get good sleep, make time for leisure activities, learn to relax, improve on work-life balance. I believe all this, we can do them at uh, whichever level we are. This is a simple, this is a simple illustration of work-life balance, where you need to balance spiritual, physical, your emotion, or your financials, your social, because it is a long list of things that cause mental illness. And if you can balance all these, then I believe that everyone of us will enjoy a lot of mental wellness. So I don't know whether I have moved very fast, but thank you for your participation. If you have questions, you can post them on the chat. And I believe we are going to answer them. So thank you very much for that, for your attention, and even for coming to the meeting with us. Thank you. Okay. Doctor? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Wairimo, for that. Uh, presentation. You've covered almost everything, uh, but uh, we'll still hear some more. The next presenter is James Otieno Okeo. He is an accomplished and seasoned attorney, an advocate of the High Court of Kenya, arbitrator, medical law expert, and employment law expert. With cumulative 25 years experience as an exceptional leader in law. He's an expert in managerial and administrative responsibilities, with demonstrable experience in institutional business management. Analytical researcher who presents data and materials clearly and practices sound and thorough case analysis techniques. An ambitious arbitrator who listens and prioritizes conflict resolutions through mediation and empathetic communication. James is a senior partner and the lead for litigation and alternative dispute resolution at Muthoga, Muthoga Gaturu and Company Advocates, specifically tasked with supporting technical teams whilst providing strategic vision and leadership in diverse legal matters. James has been appointed to sit on numerous boards and committees. So James, you're most welcome to tell us uh, what is the legal aspect of mental health issues. Our workers who suffer from mental health protected by law, as we see that some, maybe when they become sick, they are sacked by the employers. Maybe 
maybe the public sector is doing better than the, than the private sector, but please uh, give us your word and please don't exit 10 minutes because of time. Welcome to uh, James. Thank you, Dr. Ambua. Uh, 10 minutes is really a short time, but I'll see what I can share with you within the 10 minutes. I must concede uh, that I enjoyed the paper by Wairimu. She has covered many of the areas I would have wanted to also highlight. But people have always wondered whether in this country we have a legal framework uh, to govern uh, mental health. The truth is that we do have, and uh, Maybe it's just the dissemination of this information that we have not been generous even as lawyers to share with members of the public the provisions that govern mental uh, health in this country. One, the place to start would be to look at our constitution. The constitution of Kenya is uh, quite generous uh, with the provisions uh, relating to uh, the rights of individuals, including the rights of people with mental uh, illnesses or challenges. And one of the articles that one may want to look at in the constitution would be even for issues of uh, uh, labor, we do not discriminate. We say that every Kenyan is entitled to fair labor practices. So whether you are mentally, uh, 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 you have mental issues or not, all of us are entitled to mental, to fair labor practices. So in the workplace, we do not discriminate. And those members uh, of uh, the employment force who discriminate, you soon find yourself in trouble with the law. Uh, the other article that I would want maybe to share with you is Article 43 of the Constitution. Article 43 of the Constitution is what I referred to earlier as the article that governs economic and social rights. And it is true that in our constitution, which is quite uh, uh, progressive, having been passed just in 2010, and we are learning to interact with it, every person has the right to the highest attainable standard of health, which includes the right to healthcare services, and also even rights of uh, reproductive healthcare. Then I would want to look at the specific rights uh, that would apply to or gain people with uh, uh, mental uh, challenges. And I would refer you people to Article 4, uh, or rather Chapter 4 of the, uh, of the Constitution, which is the, the Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights is a, an integral part of Kenya's democratic uh, a state and is the actual framework for the social and economic uh, and cultural practices. Uh, the purpose, of course, of recognizing and protecting human rights and fundamental freedom is to preserve the human dignity and people who face uh, mental challenges have uh, the right to have their duty, uh, their dignity protected. And uh, the Constitution is quite clear on that. And it says that it's every person has, uh, should enjoy the rights and fundamental uh, uh, freedoms that are in the bill, not just uh, for people who do not face a mental. Article 26 of our constitution, of course, gives uh, every person the right to life, and even people with uh, mental challenges have the right, to, that right uh, secured and should be protected. In Article 27 of the constitution, again, it provides that every person is equal before the law and has the right to equal protection and equal benefit of the law. So we cover even people with this mental challenges. And for avoidance of doubt, our constitution binds all state officers and the state in general not to discriminate directly or indirectly against any person on any ground, including the health status and also including issues of disability. So the constitution is quite sensitive on that regard. The other article that I normally would draw to people's attention is Article 28 which provides that every person has the right and freedom of uh, security of the person. They have a right not to be arbitrarily searched or something like that. And uh, one may also wish to look at Article 31, which provides that every person has the right to privacy. Even people with uh, mental uh, challenges have a right to their privacy. Sometimes we disregard this in the way we treat them as if they are not entitled to, uh, to privacy, which the constitution specifically protects. Uh, uh, 
Finally, I would want to uh, draw your attention to Article 54 of the Constitution. Again, Article 54 of the Constitution specifically touches on people with disability, and it provides that they are entitled to be treated with dignity and respect and to be addressed and referred to in a manner that is not demeaning. Because I think that is one of the challenges we have. When you have any mental uh, 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 health issues or concerns, people tend to refer to in very demeaning and derogatory terminologies. And uh, that, of course, is something that I'm sure some of my colleagues will talk about, stigma that attaches to somebody having mental health concerns. Finally, still in Article 54, it provides that every person has a right to access materials and devices to overcome those constraints arising from that person's disability, even in this case, uh, people with mental uh, health concerns. So it is true that the legal pro uh, framework provided by the Constitution is embraces people with mental challenges. And the problem is us, who in interacting with the Constitution, does not give the, uh, the Constitution the support that is called for in handling people and issues revolving around mental health status. When I leave the Constitution, uh, I would uh, again appreciate the uh, presentation by my colleague. Uh, we do, in fact, have policies. We have policies that revolve around uh, mental health or the uh, uh, well being of uh, people as far as their mental health is concerned. And the Kenya Mental Health Policy 2015 to 2030 is quite vibrant, as Wairimu has pointed out. And besides the policy, there's some serious action plan on how to deal with mental health concerns. And the Kenya Mental Health Action Plan is running from 2021 to 2025. I think the Ministry of Health has done a good job in even trying to dis disseminate these uh, uh, action plans. So when we look at the developments again now in the specific legislation, the specific law that deals with uh, uh, mental health, it is the Mental Health Act. We had been having a Mental Health Act, uh, uh, the one in operation was 1989, and a lot has happened since 1989. One of the things that happened, of course, was the uh, promulgation of our constitution in 2010, and subsequently in 2017, we had uh, a new Health Act. So we have the constitution in 2010, we have the new Health Act in 2017, and as Wairimu had pointed out, there was then concerted effort to specifically deal with mental health. And this necessitated the uh, uh, publication of a bill in that regard, which was the Mental Health Amendment Bill of 2020. It went through uh, the various lawmaking processes, culminating in the president's signing it in. Hello, have we lost you? You have lost yeah. James? You have lost James? I think we have lost him. Okay. Um, I think his connectivity has gone haywire. All right. So before we get him, mm. or as we wait for him, I think we can welcome on board the next presenter who has another engagement immediately or just in a few minutes. So I would like to welcome Professor Charity Waidima. Professor Charity Waidima is an assistant professor of psychology at United States International University, Africa. Uh, she's a mental health consultant and psychotherapist pra practitioner. She's a practicing therapist or counselor a certified family mediator with Kenya Judiciary. Her research interest is in adolescent psychology and family. She is an ardent life skill, uh, life skill coach in prevention of alcohol and drug, uh, drug use. Professor Waidima is a mental health consultant with organizations and institutions. So welcome, Professor. Uh, she will talk to us on uh, prevention and management of uh, mental illnesses. So Charity, you're welcomed. 
Okay, thank you, Rebecca. It's a pleasure. And thank you to my co-presenters who have presented very well. So uh, I will, I'm a, uh, as you've heard, I'm a mental health uh, consultant and also an educator. And so when I'm given what I'm supposed to present, I go straight to it. Uh, I'm supposed to talk about prevention of mental illnesses. We have seen what mental uh, health is. And so uh, when we don't have good mental health, we have mental illnesses. We've talked about the different uh, types. We have talked about the causes. We've talked about the law and we have looked at the public servants that uh, Warimo has done very well. And there, when we talk about uh, preventive, somebody is talking. Can, Victor, you can mute. Is somebody I talking or should I continue? Please proceed, proceed. Okay, sorry. Uh, when we talk about mental health preventive measures, we are simply talking about people keeping mentally healthy, reducing the risk of getting disease and also improving the quality of life because we also know that mental health illnesses give, uh, I mean, kill people. So we also need to reduce mortality. And when we, pre we talk about prevention, our aim is promoting positive mental health, like Werimo has said, and and we do this by increasing psychological awareness to the public and well-being. We also need to improve people's competence in terms of uh, management, in terms of life skills and all that, and resilience. And we need also to create supportive living environment. We know that the COVID-19 created an unsupportive living condition that have thrown people to a wide and diverse range of mental health issues. And therefore, we need to know if we are talking about prevention, uh, I hope you can hear me. We are talking about safe living environments, which is happening in our environment. Then this does not pre prevent, but it can exacerbate. For us to create an environment that is going to prevent mental health illnesses, then we need to have that conducive environment. Well, Remo and uh, and I think Quena alluded to this. We need early interventions because most uh, mental illnesses are diagnosed earlier in age. But all sometimes the families and caregivers or the society observe some of those symptoms, but they are never diagnosed and treated promptly. And therefore, we need to have early diagnosis, early treatment as interventions to promote good or healthy uh, people and prevent mental illnesses. Our mental status is not static. So even as we talk about prevention, don't think that if you're mentally healthy today, tomorrow you'll be mentally health. I mean healthy. You just need something to knock you down. You may need to lose a loved one, lose a job like we have seen uh, during the COVID-19, and that shifts your mental health status. And therefore, it's not static. It changes with what is going on in your life and what is happening to you. The symptoms of mental uh, illnesses, because I, I was uh, specifically told to talk about prevention of mental illnesses and the severity are in a spectrum. And therefore, as we think about prevention, which I'm going to talk about in three phases, we need to know that uh, mental, uh, I mean, the symptoms and the severity is all the way from mild to severe. And this determines how we deal with the mental illnesses in terms of treatment and prevention. And as we talk about prevention, it's not just about the individual or the family having preventive measures, but we also need to involve the community in handling. And I think Mr. Okeo, okay, uh, Wairimo and, uh, and Kwena have alluded to this and talked about it, especially Wairimo, 
it is not just about the individual. It also involves the community in handling the issues like stigma. Okay, has also talked about, uh, you know, stigmatization and loss of dignity for people and uh, quoted for us the different articles in the constitution. There is a need for us as a community or to encourage the community. There is need for support. We know that there are neurocognitive disorders that affect elderly people. And sometimes we leave the elderly people very lonely. Those of us who have elderly parents and uh, relatives, we leave them probably in the village or in their houses and they are very lonely. We also have seen the economic inequalities and that's why I talked about the environment, whether it is uh, political or whichever other. We know that the economic inequalities, especially in this country, are exacerbating the mental illnesses. There are people who cannot put food on the table, while there are others who have more than enough to take. The grabbing and the corruption in this country is also exacerbating. So we also need to look at environmental dangers. Uh, many of us don't bother as long as my child is okay, I will not bother. But if we don't deal with environmental dangers like drug uh, substances, that are being supplied and in large supplies in our environment. When we see then how some of the political uh, campaigners or, or candidates are, are, are putting forth their information, if we don't deal with what we call environmental dangers, then we are also in danger of not having community and individual preventive measures. So how do we prevent our mental illnesses? We have three phases and the first one is primary prevention. Primary prevention is where we are dealing with normal people and we want to stop mental health problems before they occur. Again, Wairimo covered a lot of what we are covering and a lot of it has to do with mental health awareness. Are you aware what depression means? Are you aware what can cause that depression? Are you aware what bipolar is? So we need a lot of mental health awareness and psychoeducation, both to individuals and community. We need frequent mental health checks. And thank you, Irimo, for talking about, and, uh, and uh, Mr. Okeo, for talking about the different policies, bills, and uh, that, that are there and what the, the government is putting forward and has put in place about the mental health and other health. Many of us have annual, even our employees, I mean employers and those who are employers, we give our employees a provision for physical health checks every year or even every six months, especially for dental, it's six months. Do we go for frequent mental health checks? where you're assessed and you're told you're good to go in terms of mental health. That is the first phase we want to prevent. The way you want to prevent a cardiac arrest, we also need to prevent ourselves from developing mental health illnesses. We need to deal with life stressors again, like uh, Wairimo, and uh, I think also Mr. Okeo has alluded to it, dealing with burnout, that is work-life balance. We need to, when people have lost, we need to deal with loss and grief. COVID-19, we cannot talk about mental health without mentioning the pandemic. It is through a lot of people into the ring of uh, loss and grief. We need to deal with those life stressors to protect people, prevent people developing mental health issues. We need to deal with illnesses which are physical. We need to deal with families, this functioning in families. We know that many people are encouraging even single parent families and many other things that are happening in the 21st century. But family functioning and identity of people in families, if it is put to check, then we are going to prevent Work related stressors, I've mentioned that we need to encourage and train good parenting skills. And uh, this is going to help us deal or prevent uh, people from going into mental illnesses because we are talking about the primary prevention. We need to enhance healthy or physical health. We need to know that 
physical health and mental health, and the medics in this forum will tell you that you can have a comorbidity, and if you have bad physical health or ill physical health, then that can be a precipitating factor for mental illnesses. We need to enhance people's life skills. Do you know we have so many people in the society who have no interpersonal skills, and therefore that causes a lot of mental illnesses. We know people don't know how to problem solve. Somebody talked about pessimistic thinking. I have a problem and I think the worst is happening. We need to uh, help people have positive coping skills. When you have stresses, do I go to drugs that are going to make me have a trip to mental illnesses? We need to help people with decision making. People need to be self-aware if we have to protect them from developing mental illnesses. Let's boost self-concept in terms of self-esteem. We know, psychologists know, that people with low self-esteem are candidates for mental illnesses. The people need to ask, who am I? What are my self-made beliefs? What are labels that people have given me from early childhood to where I am? Have we dealt, and again, where Remo and uh, Quena dealt with this, we have what we call ACEs, S-C-E, I, I mean, adverse childhood experiences. Do we have people who went through early life traumas and those ACEs, if we deal with them, this will be preventive and people will not develop mental health issues. We need people to have positive lifestyles. Again, Quena and Pedrimo um, talked about preventing people from using substances like alcohol and other drugs. We need people to have good sleep hygiene. With technology, we are seeing our youth and even adults spending a lot of time not sleeping but on blue on the blue screen, which is a danger to developing mental health issues. We need to be active not just to be couch potatoes. Are we encouraging people to exercise? These are primary preventions. We need proper diet, we need positive relationships, we need good parenting skills. And of course, I've talked about community engagement. When the community is engaged, we are Africans and we knew that we are communal, a child belongs to the society and if when we have that community engagement, we will pre prevent people from getting mental illnesses. The secondary prevention involves, remember the first one is those who are okay. They have no illness, mental illness. The secondary is supporting those at higher risk because as uh, Quena, I think it was Quena or Wairimo who talked about the precipitating factors, we talk about, pre, uh, I mean, predisposing factors, we have precipitating factors also. So some of those people may have those factors as a higher risk of developing mental illnesses. And in secondary prevention, we need to look at that. This may be due to personality or the experiences in life or community biases, like I've talked about it. And again, my uh, uh, Nadia, presenter talked about victims of crime, victims of war, the ACEs I've talked about, the minority and special groups, like those who are in LGBTQI uh, and uh, chronic and terminal health problems, those who are going through grief and loss. So we need to know that there are those people at high risk. They may have probably mild, they may not be in the first category, but they are at high risk because you'll find that somebody who is a homosexual will be stigmatized. Somebody who has been raped, that's a victim of, of crime, is going, can easily develop. So how do we protect them? We need to deal with resilience development because with resilience, if somebody is at high risk, somebody has been uh, raped, they can be helped either through psychotherapy or counseling and they can bounce back. Those people who have stayed well, even at the risk, those who lost their jobs, lost loved ones with COVID-19, when resilience developed and they got positive coping strategies, then we were able to protect them and prevent
them from having full-blown mental illnesses. We need, again, I've talked about community awareness and involvement. We can't ignore because the community really helps. Uh, Mr. Okeo has talked about protecting people even in their, in their jobs and doing things that are going to promote mental health. If a family has a child, like Quena and Wairimo said, who may be predisposed to genetic uh, you know, causes or other biological causes, then we need the community awareness and involvement. We also need to help people accept life the way it is. And they adhere to positive life lifestyles. So if we help people, then those who are predisposed and higher risk are going to be protected. We need to help people with cognitive and personality restructuring. You know, people with personalities like neurotic, they are easily predisposed or dependent personalities. They are easily predisposed or have a higher risk of developing mental illnesses. We need to have psychosocial support, both as individuals, families, and community, because as we talk about prevention, psychosocial support, and that's why we need to train people on interpersonal skills so that people develop in, I mean, psychosocial support. Self-awareness, I've also talked about it, and also we need to deal with stigma so that anybody who is at a risk is not stigmatized and also they are aware. And of course, there is need for therapy or counseling, psychotherapy or counseling as a prevention because somebody needs to know you are at higher risk. Your family, there is a pattern of suicide. In your family, there are some patterns of bipolar disorder. And therefore, when we are people come for counseling, they are made aware and they are counseled in order for them not to have the triggers that might trigger such illnesses, knock them down. And finally, we have the tertiary prevention. The tertiary prevention is the prevention that we use to help those who are already in or suffering from mental illnesses. We want to help them one, to recover, also cope, and we also want to improve their quality of life. You, you sometimes see people who have psychotic disorders. You see the quality of life they have very poor. So sometimes when we are doing tertiary prevention, one of the things is to improve the quality of life of people who are suffering. Some of it is just understanding the cause, the causes that Quena told us about and the cause of the illness. How does this illness begin? How does it develop? How does it, uh, the, how are the symptoms and how does this illness progress? So when we understand that, then we are able to prevent the people who are already sick from deteriorating. We need to deal with stigma and labels from self and others. You, you know the words people use in, their, in your communities. Some of them will even say, I'm a mogoroki. That is in my community. I don't know what you use in your community. And that is self-stigma. And also others will stigmatize. And when you stigmatize already a sick person, there is that make-believe or what we call the self-fulfilling prophecy. And that exacerbates the illness that the person has. We need psychosocial support. Uh, Mr. Okeo has talked about the rights. So we need advocacy in terms of supportive employment. We need to let employers know that yes, somebody has a mental health illness, but that does not mean if they are the treatment, they can't continue working. As a therapist, I'm a practicing therapist. When I've advocated for people to retain their employment, I have seen a lot of them because remember they are going to afford treatment, also they are going to be occupied. Some of the triggers are the triggers that come as a result of people being stigmatized and therefore we need to do advocacy for those who are sick. We need to educate and also offer other services to people. Those who are already ill, there is need for referral, for treatment. The first stop shop I always say is a psychologist and mainly a clinical psychologist will be able to advise
advance their assessment and work together with psychiatrists and other medics in order to treat. And as they are being treated, there, there is need to help them adhere and support them to adhere to mental health treatment and other treatments. Uh, we have just seen from Moirimu that HIV is one of the triggers that can bring about mental illness. And therefore, if somebody is on other medication, not just the psychotropic medication, that, that, that is mental health uh, treatment, we also need to encourage them to adhere to such treatments. Empowerment in managing the condition. And this is where sometimes we even start support groups for those who are unwell, for those who are already addicted to substance use. We take them for rehabilitation. We need to empower in managing the condition because in tertiary prevention, we are dealing with those who are already sick. Of course, we need to psychoeducate on self-care and also educate the other caregivers. Some, like somebody said, they will tie children with Down syndrome and other neurocognitive disorders and tie them and hide them. But if we train such caregivers to understand what mental illnesses are and how to care for the, their loved ones who have it, then we, we are going to help them to recover and also have good quality life. Of course, with self-care, both for the sick and for the caregivers, they need to stay active, they need to exercise, they need uh, social connection, they need to eat well, they need the sleep hygiene that I talked about. And of course, enhancing positive coping strategies to prevent relapse. And still, those who are sick, because especially in a country like this one, we know there is so much misdiagnosis. And I'm happy what Mr. Okeo, uh, Okeo has talked about. And this is something we have been discussing this week. Those of you who are psychologists, we, the government has allowed us to go ahead and form the mental health board. And this is going to help in standardization. It's going to help in regulation. And when we do that, we are going to remove quirks, which is going to help with proper diagnosis and treatment. And when we have proper diagnosis and treatment, and then we are going to have symptom reduction and improve the quality of life of those who are suffering. Okay, thank you. You are through, Charity? Yes, I am. That's why okay. they thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for that uh, very passionate uh, a presentation. You may stop sharing. Thank you. Uh, I can see questions are coming, but before we go to the questions, uh, we have two more presenters, and one of them is Sami Ocheng. Maybe I can introduce him well. Uh, Sami Ocheng is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. Uh, he is an employment law specialist. He's also a gospel musician by the name Gospel Dynamite, and he's a mental wellness advocate. Uh, through the presentations, you've been hearing the word labeling, the word stigma. So he's going to talk about the stigmatization of persons suffering from uh, mental illness. So you are welcome. You have your 10 minutes, uh, Sami. Okay, thanks a lot. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, as you have been told, I'm Samuel Ocheng. I'm an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. And uh, uh, to, to, have this, uh, to talk about stigma, maybe I give you a background of what I'm <laughs> battling. I'm battling uh, a, a mental illness called bipolar one disorder. And uh, there are three types of bipolar. We have bipolar one, bipolar 2, and cyclothermic disorder. And uh, in that chain, cyclothermic disorder is the mild, mildest form of bipolar. Then you go to bipolar 2, where a person suffers from hypomania and depression. Then we have bipolar 1, which is the worst form of bipolar. So in this, uh, in this bipolar, you, you, you suffer from something called mania or uh, depression. You oscillate between the two mood swings. And when you get to the mania, 
you can now go overboard and lose your mind. And to, to, to tell you the background, I was first diagnosed uh, suffering from bipolar one in the year 2000. So I battled bipolar one for, for 22 years. And uh, in 22 years, uh, discrimination and stigma uh, battled throughout from the first day I was diagnosed. Uh, remember in bipolar one, you lose your mind. That's why it's called bipolar one. You can lose your mind when you go to the mania where you have your eyes. And uh, I've lost my mind and been forcefully taken to the hospital over 15 times in the period that uh, I've suffered bipolar for the 22 years. So out of this, you can imagine the level of stigma I have experienced in my life throughout the 22 years. I've been, uh, uh, you know, even uh, just the other day, just uh, I think th three days ago, uh, I, I had a brief argument with somebody in bipolar, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the social media. And uh, he, she ended by telling me, have you taken your medication, senior? And you remember, this is a colleague. So <laughs> whenever there's an argument or uh, people, uh, we are talking and it's a heated debate, people will always jokingly tell me if I've taken medication. And uh, there are some of colleagues who tell me uh, in an argument, they tell me, uh, counsel, I will not engage with you further because of your mental health. And uh, many people did not know I was suffering from bipolar when I came out. Uh, they didn't know. So they, most people knew about my condition after I publicly said that I'm battling bipolar one. They thought I was a normal person, but the stigma came in when I now started telling Stop people, telling people I'm battling bipolar, bipolar one before, before they didn't, they know. didn't know. And stigma and is just a, a negative perception. Yeah. And it's a perception that somebody has or because of a distinguished characteristic, characteristic of somebody, distinguishing characteristic like maybe me mental illness that somebody has now, you, you have a negative or a stereotype or a prejudice against that somebody because of what is going through. And remember, uh, stigma comes from ignorance because uh, many people do not know about uh, mental illnesses. So because they have not educated themselves, they have not uh, done research. So they label people with mental illnesses because, uh, for example, uh, even during the Neolithic times, uh, when uh, the, the history of man began, uh, people uh, who had mental health issues were regarded as people who have evil forces in them. In fact, they used to drill holes in the skulls of people to drive away the evil spirits. And this thing, interestingly, has not gone away even in our Kenyan society. Uh, when I was, uh, the, between the period I was first diagnosed in the year 2000 to, to today, I've been prayed for by over 15 pastors who tries to, to drive away demons from me. And uh, there are times I've been anointed with anointing oil. Sometimes I'm uh, uh, surrounded by pastors whenever I have a relapse. So they come, they pray, uh, trying to uh, chase away demons, but they, it never helped. The demons never went, and uh, I never became well. And uh, oh, in, uh, interestingly, it's only medication that saved the situation, not prayers. That's why I usually tell people to, to as you pray also, seek medication because the answer is with the psychiatrists and the psychologists and the and the therapists so uh bipolar is uh, perpetuated by the media also you see in the media they are, they depict the the villain the bad person in the media in the in the movie usually somebody with a mental health issue in fact there was a movie called joker in the year 2019 where the villain the bad person in the movie was depicted as somebody with a mild, uh, with a mental illness and therefore he was violent so whenever people see these things in the media they now perpetuate stigma against mental health uh, issues against people and therefore they think that these people are violent harmful stereotypes that people label people uh, in the year 2002 i was uh, uh, I, I i was admitted at uh, nairobi university to study economics and sociology and remember during this time is when i was first diagnosed with uh, bipolar in fact i went through the four years of study but i couldn't graduate because i failed in 16 units 
Why? Because people labeled, my fellow students uh, knew about my condition. They labeled me as a mad person, calling me cheesy as I pass, uh, asking me if I've taken medication. And so I, I lived in isolation. The, uh, I never used to go to the lecture halls. I stayed in the, in the hostels during this time, uh, avoiding meeting people because of stigma. So you see the way uh, stigma makes a person live an isolated life. You can't have even social relationships with other people. I couldn't even get a girlfriend in, in, in college because uh, now uh, they have labeled me and uh, I, I can't interact with, I, I didn't even have friends. So those are the negative effects of stigma. And then stigma makes people to avoid even going to, to seek medication because they have already been labeled and they think they are mad and therefore they seek solution by themselves. Re remember, also there was a, uh, a, a time I went for a job interview and I knew I couldn't get that job because the, the interviewer knew about my condition. So people with the mental illnesses uh, find themselves that they can't get to work. They, uh, they can't even have stable relationships. They, they have low self-esteem because of stigma. They're, uh, even, even housing, even uh, landlords avoid people like, like uh, who have mental illnesses. They, they fear them and they think they won't even pay rent. There are fewer opportunities for work. They are, the bullying, bullying and uh, uh, physical violence and harassment against people with mental illnesses is on the rise even in this nation. When I was in uh, Nairobi University, when I was studying sociology and economics, I was really bullied. I was bullied. Uh, People always become, some even almost became violent towards me because of these misconceptions. And therefore, stigma can be reduced. Stigma is something that can be reduced. It's, uh, it's a land behavior. It's not, uh, uh, so how, how can people reduce stigma? By talking openly about uh, these commental health issues. Do we talk, we have, we, so that people get to know. And therefore, if you have anybody that you know that is suffering from a mental illness, get to, to, to draw close to him and to talk to him. You'll, you'll be surprised and amazed at uh, how it will dispel all those myths that are in your head. People need to educate themselves. Uh, in this age of Google and Wikipedia, you can just Google this, uh, the, the causes of mental illnesses, the causes of bipolar, causes of schizophrenia. It is just at your fingertips in your, in your phone. So, so instead of perpetuating stigma, and therefore, every person who has a mental illness, my advice to you is to study, is to, is to work hard so that you, you achieve greatness in this society, so that uh, when you are out there, they see that uh, me, my fellow advocates are amazed that with bipolar one, even magistrates and judges, that this person had bipolar one disorder. And how comes he managed to study law and pass? Uh, I, uh, in about the year 2006, my, one of my psychiatrists psychiatrist wrote me off and said, uh, even in his recommendation, he said that this person should not step in class because of his uh, mental illness. He cannot achieve it. So uh, I defied all the odds. You see, I studied law, went to Kenya School of Law, and you see the way law is very demanding even to pass. And I'm one of the top advocates of, uh, in, uh, and a specialist in employment law. So let us achieve great success if you have a mental illness. And this will be able to, to reduce the stigma uh, that people are perpetuating against us. So let us show compassion to people with mental illnesses and draw close to them. And there are three types of, as I finish, there are three, three types of stigma that are out there in the world. One is public stigma. The public, the misconceptions that are, are with people out there in the, in the public, what they think ill about people with mental illnesses. Then there is self stigma. This is the shame that the person who is suffering from mental illness has about himself and the, the self low self-esteem that somebody has. So, and the last one is, is uh, institutional stigma, which occurs by the policies that uh, different institutions have against that reduces the, the employment of people with mental illnesses. They have policies, they have guidelines, and you find that even in our government, for example, there's shortage of funding for people who are on the ground, who are helping people with mental illnesses, the Mental Health Institute. And I'm happy that recently the president has uh, signed in the mental health law bill and uh, at least there's support for the people who are on the ground.
Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sami, for that very good presentation about stigmatization. I can see a number of people have been asking questions around that, and I'm sure they have understood why this topic is very important. Now, our last presenter is Ruth Ambogo. She's a, a youth policy and governance expert. She'll talk about the issue of psychosocial support and maybe give some recommendations on what she feels has not been done and should be done. So welcome, Ruth. Ruth, are you with us? Unmute, unmute, Ruth. Kindly unmute. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Unmute. Uh, Ole, sorry about that. Um, I'm saying I appreciate the people who have spoken before me. And uh, in my presentation, I think I'll be making reference to some of what has been said already. Um, I'm supposed to speak about support systems, how to build support systems, how to be of support to persons suffering from mental illness, and what can be done to just make life a bit easier. Uh, first of all, I think I'll focus my attention mostly on a mental health uh, condition that a majority of the young population faces or suffers from, and not just the young population, but generally, you know, um, it, I'm, I'm going to talk about depression. I know most people never want to classify depression under mental health because of the stigma that is around uh, the term mental illness, but we have to classify it under mental illness because indeed it is a form of mental illness. So depression is a commonly, um, it's a common uh, mental illness that most young people go through. And just to make us understand how depression manifests itself, because I think quite a lot of people go undiagnosed and untreated, and as a result, continue to even suffer greater, you know, um, the, the situations deteriorate and become worse and even, I mean, uh, degenerate into other forms of mental illnesses that would have been prevented if they had been identified earlier or diagnosed earlier. So I think for depression, many people might be going through depression without even knowing that they are going through depression. So to begin us off, I will, I will, I will try to uh, explain how mental, how depression has, I mean, for me personally as an individual, how depression has manifested in my life and how it generally manifests in people who suffer from the same. So the symptoms that you are going through depression or anyone around you, a loved one is going through depression, would be first of all, lethargy, general lack of energy. You know, you just don't have the energy to do anything. Uh, number two, you're probably uh, having trouble sleeping. So let's say for instance, you have a regular sleep pattern or sleep schedule, which is that you sleep at 10, you wake up at five or six. So you find yourself uh, when, you're, when you're about to start facing depression or when you are going through depression, you might struggle to sleep. You might find yourself sleeping later. You know, if you are sleeping at 10, you'll start sleeping at 12, sometimes even as late as 3 a.m. And uh, so for some people, what would end up happening is that because they have struggled to sleep, they will end up sleeping for very few hours. So someone sleeps at 3, has to wake up at 7 to go to work. So that's literally uh, a four-hour sleeping uh, period when you should be getting as much as seven or six or seven to eight hours of sleep. So, and for other people, it could actually manifest in oversleeping, so sleeping too much. So if you are sleeping for seven hours, you find yourself sleeping for even 10, 12, uh, 13 hours. Some people even sleep for half a day, you know, and uh, even beyond 13 hours, 14 hours a day, you're asleep. Or sometimes you find yourself sleeping the normal number of hours that you normally sleep from 10 to 6 a.m. But in the course of the day, you're too tired, you don't have energy, you take what you would think is a nap, but you find yourself sleeping for four hours during the day, you know, so that is already excessive amount of sleep. Um, for some people, there's irritability, you're easily irritable, small things get you worked up, you get, you know, you're always overreacting to issues. Um, in some cases, there's in most cases of people suffering from depression, there's this interest in things that would normally excite you. So if you're somebody, for instance, like myself, I, I do political analysis and I've always told people who are my close friends that if you notice, anytime you notice that I am off the 
screens, off TV screens for a long period of time, that's a sign that I'm definitely going through depression because that's something that I take as a hobby, something that I do frequently. I'm always on media literally once or twice, uh, twice or three times, once a week. But the moment I stop doing that for an extended period of time, I get disinterested in the things that I like. For instance, just um, if, if I'm somebody who likes to go out to dance over the weekend, the moment I stop doing that, if I love doing karaoke, that's a sign that I'm either falling into depression or I'm already undergoing depression. For other people, um, it, it, it becomes as worse as managing a simple day. Day-to-day -day tasks become difficult. You know, For some people, they can go for two, three days without showering. You don't even feel like you want to brush your teeth. You don't feel like you want to uh, tidy up your living space. So your, your house is dirty, you're not showering, you're not doing, you literally do not have the energy to do the simplest of tasks. It is not that you do not want to do them. You want to do them, but the, the, you know the famous saying that the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. So literally you find yourself in a situation where you want to shower, but you don't have the willpower to get out of your bed and get to the shower and get that, you know, get that done. You don't have the energy to simply brush your teeth. So, you know, trouble managing day-to-day -day tasks. And um, in some cases, it presents itself in the form of your over, overfeeding, you're either overeating or you're undereating. So you literally don't eat during the day. You can go for a day or even a day and a half without eating, or you only eat when it is so necessary. You're so hungry, like you're pushed to the corner that you literally, at the point at which you're pushed to the corner, that is when you want to eat. Or for some people, it's overeating. So those signs and symptoms that I have mentioned put together would define someone going through depression uh, or someone who is just about to fall into depression. And uh, in talking about what kind of support we can offer to people going through depression, I'm going to talk about personal experience. So whatever it is I say is what I have seen people around me do for me or what I have expected people around me to, you know, to do for me as a way of showing their support towards my, you know, uh, the, my support towards me or my support for me when I'm going through depression. I think number one is to check on persons going through depression frequently, you know, just establish a routine with them. Be the person that will constantly call them every other morning, be that one phone call they will make because they have already cut communication. Depression puts you in a situation where you don't want to relate to anybody. You don't want to communicate with anyone. For most people, you literally don't have the energy to talk to anyone. So you can go for three, four days or even an entire week without talking to anyone. And that makes the situation worse. So be that family friend, be that personal friend, be that person who will check on that person going through depression frequently. Like make a phone call in the morning. And you don't have to be overbearing. Just, you know, how are you? Did you wake up? Yes. You know, did you eat? Just simple checking up. How was your day? Even if they can't express themselves or even if they will not pick your call, they will acknowledge that there's somebody somewhere who actually cares about me. Um, uh, second, uh, if possible, live with a person going through depression. Like uh, for a family member, you might have a sister going through depression. If you have siblings as a family, maybe that would be the time to say, uh, let a younger sister go live with them because living alone makes the situation worse, especially where the depression is so severe that this person cannot take care of themselves. It would be good to have someone, if it is so severe, have someone live with, with you, especially for the younger generation that tends to live. We are always living on our own. We are in Nairobi living on our own. We don't, uh, you're in your own apartment without anybody uh, anybody present to check on you. So just have, you know, if, if possible, have somebody to live with, with the, the person going through depression. Uh, third and most important, embrace persons going through mental illness, you know? And embracing them means constantly reminding them that it is not their fault that they are where they are. Because you find some families or you find situations where you're going through a mental health, and this is not just um, limited to uh, depression only, but any other form of mental illness. You find people who would try to uh, find explanations as to why you're undergoing um, uh, the, the form of mental illness that you're going through. Someone will even come up with a, an explanation and say, oh, you are cast, your, your family is cast, or you did this, and that is why you're going through what you're going through. So constantly remind this person that it is not your fault it is not out of your doing that you're in the situation that you're in, you know, that it is not your fault. Because 
uh, most times a person going through depression will be constantly saying, you know, it is my fault, will be constantly placing the blame on themselves or any other form of mental illness, will be constantly saying that maybe had I not done this, I would not be in this situation. So just remind them that it is just a function, it's just a functionality of their brains. It is probably because the chemical imbalance, probably because of a chemical imbalance in the brain that is causing the type of mental illness that they are undergoing. Um, fourth, be willing to be part of their psychosocial healing process. Some of the mental illnesses that people go through are caused or triggered by things that are done by people close to them. So you find that um, maybe as a result of a difficult childhood that you had, you will be predisposed to certain mental illnesses. Like, li like literally for some people, uh, let's say you have bipolar and some of the triggers that cause you to get into episodes or have um, episodes is because of how the kind of difficult childhood that you went through. So as a family unit or those around the person suffering mental illness, it would be it is very important, and this is something that my one of my my, my psychologists uh, told me that it is important that family is around as you're going through your therapy sessions because some of these triggers can be resolved by literally having family members also attend these therapy sessions as you're going for the therapy sessions as a, as a, as a, as a person going through mental illness have the family members around as well or people that you consider to be uh, triggers to your mental illness present at some of these sessions so that you can resolve. It is a way of resolving and healing and going through some of uh, unresolved issues that you have, that you have, you know, piling up in your life for long periods of time. And that could actually assist in having a more stable life, living a more stable life, even though you have mental illnesses, that it can reduce the number of times that you have episodes, it can reduce the number of times that you have to go through depression. So if uh, possible, not necessarily if possible, I insist on the fact that as a family member, as someone who might be a trigger to the mental illness of a person going through mental illnesses, be part of the healing process, attend therapy with them. Uh, also keep them engaged, uh, keep, you know, keep them engaged by participating in activities they like, uh, like outdoor activities. For instance, for me, Whenever I am going through depression, I have friends of mine who, um, once they know that I have notified them that, by the way, I'm going through depression, they make it a point to ensure that at least once a week, I'm out of the house, you know, like at least, especially when it's getting, um, when it is getting too serious, they tell me, Ruth, Lazima turned out. Like it doesn't necessarily mean that going out would involve taking alcohol, but just going out and you know, uh, go for lunch somewhere, expose yourself to an outdoor activity, go for a walk, uh, go out for dancing. You know, it it helps with the healing process. It makes healing much easier and much faster for anyone going through depression. Um, remind them to take their medication and why it is important. There's there's a friendly reminder that you can. You can, you can friendly remind someone going through you know, depression or mental illness to take their medication without it looking like you're stigmatizing them. I understand that uh, Samuel spoke about, some spoke about how people would make fun of him or still make fun of him sometimes by you know, lightly joking about, have you taken your medication? There's a way in which you can remind someone of why they need to take their medication in a manner that you know, shows that you care about them and that you know, they, it is for their own good. So, Constantly reminding them that medication is important because I think most people who suffer from mental illnesses really struggle with medication. Personally, I, sometimes I struggle with medication because uh, the reason why sometimes people struggle with medication is some of the side effects of the medication that, that come with, I mean, some of the side effects that come with taking the medication that uh, is assigned to you know various mental illnesses. Sometimes you find uh, you're taking medication, you gain weight, you know, uh, it messes up with your entire system. Uh, it, 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 it just, for, for, and for me, mostly why I struggle with me medication is mostly because of the weight gain issues. And for some people, it can be severe. The, the, mental, uh, the, the medication assigned to their mental illness could actually cause, um, um, could actually cause, uh, could actually cause um, uh, other related illnesses such as even anxiety because I had a friend of mine recently talking about how she was given medication for depression and it actually led to her having you know anxiety uh, increasing anxiety and, and and anxiety episodes that she would have so just constantly reminding one to take medication and if the medication is proving problematic uh, assisting them with you know 
going to seek a second opinion, um, going to seek a second opinion from doctors as to which other medication they can take. Um, also, reminding reminding a mental health patient of important days, such as you know, just constantly reminding them that oh, by the way, your therapy sessions are coming up in the next uh, two days. Please remember to attend, and if possible, go with them. You know, because sometimes we find it hard to leave the house to go get therapy. You know, maybe the hospital that you're going to is far away from where you live and you literally don't want to leave the house. So as a person who is offering care and support, be there for them, remind them of those days and if possible, take them. Um, and uh, I think uh, most importantly is also uh, financial support. I don't know if the people who are listening to this understand how expensive mental health is. Sometimes you find uh, that you have been prescribed medication that is literally 65 shillings a tablet, and you're expected to take to be on this medication for as for some people, it's you're expected to be on this medication for life. This is 65 shillings a tablet, and maybe your prescription says that you should be taking two tablets in the morning and maybe two in the in the in the evening. That's literally um, about three three hundred shillings a day that you're spending on medication. So. If you have a mental health uh, patient who is medic, you need to find out first of all how much does the medication cost? Are they in a position to afford this medication? Because I find that sometimes most relapses take place because people don't have access to medication because of how expensive it is. So if you can be able to support them uh, by simply saying, look, I might not be able to be there for you, but all I can do is um, buy you medication, that would go a long way in helping. Uh, manage, you know, the mental illness of uh, the mental illness that they are suffering from. Uh, and one thing that one thing that I find we overlook, which would be the final, uh, you know, point that I'm going to make is family intervention when someone is at risk. Some people go through mental illnesses because of the kind of conditions or situations they are in. So you find that someone is in a marriage, an abusive marriage, an abusive relationship, and especially mostly marriages, yeah? So you're in an abusive marriage, you're constantly being beaten up, and family, instead of intervening and either getting you out of that situation, forces you to be there, telling you the tales that we are always told by society that, oh, maisha ni kuvundoa ni kuvumiliana, and yet the mental health of this person is deteriorating day by day. And that is why we find a lot of cases of people in relationships and marriages committing suicide because instead of getting them, sometimes it is as it is so bad that the only solution is to get them out of that situation. So families need to be proactive in assessing what is the cost of, uh, what kind of situation is your family member in? Are they in an abusive relationship that they need to get out of, that they can only get out of with the support of the family? Or not, you know. So if they're in a risk situation, literally just get them out of it. I mean, you you are you are you're better off dealing with an alive uh, relative than a dead relative in the name of no anikuvumiliana or relationships is about uh, tolerating each other. Uh, in institutions, how do we offer support to persons suffering mental health um, illnesses? And before I talk about institutions, as a personal uh, on a personal capacity level, how do you offer support to yourself? To ensure that you're constantly remaining, you know, you're, you're, you're either improving on your mental wellness or you're, you're constantly getting the support that you need. I would advise that you get a person, uh, you get uh, you get either a therapist, a counseling psychologist, or a psychiatrist who will be on dial, on call and dial, on a speed dial for you. And for me, I'm grateful, and in fact, I'm grateful that uh, she's literally listening to this session. I am grateful that one of the best things that have happened to me this year is finding um, a lady by the name Quinta, I've even seen her responding to some of the questions. Um, she's a therapist, she's a counseling psychologist. So have someone on someone that you can always have on speed dial. Even if you, you make a side arrangement where you say our uh, sessions, I'll be paying for our sessions per phone call or whatever sort of arrangement you come up with, find someone that will always be on speed dial because our mental health care systems or our, our mental health care systems are so overworked. In, in, they are overworked in the sense that you will go to a hospital that tells you, you will always be having monthly therapy sessions. And yet on a day-to-day -day basis, you will be encountering situations that are so difficult, situations that are putting your mental health at risk that cannot wait for that end of the month or two week session for you to deal with them. That you literally need to have someone that you would call and say, hey, by the way, 
kimeumana, how do I deal with this situation? So that you don't pile up issues waiting for the end of the month or waiting for one and a half months to meet a therapist. And by the time you're meeting them, the issues have compounded to an extent where you cannot, you can no longer deal with them. They're already blowing out of proportion and you're either going to fall sick again or you're even falling, your depression is even getting worse because you don't have constant access to uh, therapy or counseling. So if there's a way in which you can find yourself constant access to therapy or counseling and find an affordable solution arrangement with somebody that can always listen to you when you need you know somebody to get your mind in the right space or when you need somebody to guide you on how to deal with a particular issue get that for yourself so institutional support schools need to have mental health uh, a mental health policy or need to have in place um, some sort of arrangement that ensures that there's a mental health department or there's somebody in every faculty that is handling mental health issues because um, I remember in my university, uh, before mental health departments were introduced, life was very difficult for me. I mean, you'd find that um, I'm struggling with, maybe I'm struggling with my dissertation or I'm struggling with an assignment because maybe at that particular time I'm going through depression and then I'm trying to reach out to a lecturer and explain to them that, okay, I missed out on a deadline because I am literally going through this particular situation. I'll give a, I'll give a story of how one lecturer literally uh, told me that, you know, I am faking it. I have been faking that I am not okay. And, um, you know, for me, these are all stories I'm putting up. I'm, 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 I'm just coming up with stories to try and avoid beating, uh, meeting the deadlines that the lecturers had put in place. When in real time, I was suffering serious depression. So schools need to come up with departments or just, you know, and in those departments have either a, a, a counseling psychologist, a psychiatrist, or somebody who is, a proper qualified physician who can deal with mental health issues and have the system work in such a way that if a student presents the, themselves to you with evidence that they are undergoing a particular mental health issue that might affect their studies, let those departments be the ones to deal with the various lecturers and explain to these lecturers that, oh, by the way, this particular student in your faculty is undergoing depression or is undergoing is, is going through bipolar or has uh, schizophrenia and because of that they are, their learning might be affected they might not necessarily deliver on time if expected to and if and sometimes they might even underperform in their assignments please be lenient with them or find a way of how you can work with them to support them and enable them you know complete their education at the workplaces i think um, of importance over and above the other uh, provisions that a workplace can put in place, the most important thing for a workplace is to eliminate toxic procedures that might predispose employees to mental health issues. So you might find that you're in a workplace where it is literally just toxic. The managers are toxic, everybody's toxic. The practices, you know, the, the expectations that, um, how, how, the staff, how the managers and directors and the people in charge of employees handle their employees. So, Eliminate, try and eliminate, make the working environment conducive for people to, and, and, and avoid, conducive for people to literally avoid uh, having persons who would otherwise not have suffered mental illnesses. You know, just avoid creating an environment that would make it possible for people to uh, get into depression because of the kind of uh, setup of that work environment. Uh, second, if you have, um, once of course have a mental health department or have the HRs, trained on how to deal with mental health issues at the workplace. And if an employee presents to you an issue or comes to you with an issue, a mental health case and says, I am going through uh, depression and here is my evidence. These are my doctor's letters. Uh, dealing with, find a way of how you can adjust uh, either your timelines for these employees or have reasonable expectations of what kind of output you'd want them to deliver, what kind of deliverables you'd want them to uh, to, to the, the kind of output you expect of them. So if, for instance, the expectation was that they need to be at 100% productivity level and you have learned that they are going through depression, it would probably be reasonable to adjust your expectations to probably 70% or even 60% until they get well so that you, don't, uh, you, do, you do not insert unnecessary pressure on someone who is already undergoing uh, the pressure of suffering from a mental illness. And uh, sometimes it might call for adjusting timelines because you might find someone suffering mental, uh, for instance, depression, and they're struggling with waking up in the morning. If they share 
that look, I am really struggling with waking up early because of my sleep patterns. Maybe it might be prudent to allow them to come to work a little bit later. If the expectation is that they should arrive at workplaces at, at eight, uh, be lenient with them, allow them to come in at nine, nine thirty, and leave later, or just you know manage. Uh, adjust their work timelines to to give them a more conducive working environment up until the point that they will have achieved uh, full recovery and stability. And uh, to finish up, what I would propose to the government and uh, the task forces that are dealing with mental health is to subsidize the cost of mental health. Mental health is very expensive. Uh, some will tell you that medication is the only solution, uh, but over and above medication, um, counseling is much more, is, is, is even important. They say medication is important, but counseling is important because that helps you literally recover and find stability. But without that uh, medical care uh, subsidized, many people will continue suffering in silence. Many people will continue, they will be diagnosed, but they will continue suffering and even their situations getting worse because they can either not afford medication or they cannot afford uh, the therapy that is required to help them stabilize and live comfortably and be able to be productive despite them having mental health conditions. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. That, uh, that was quite uh, elaborate. Uh, so participants, I'm sure you've learned a lot this evening. I've been looking at your comments, uh, what you'd like or the questions you are asking. And I'm happy that majority of the questions have been answered. Some are asking for notes as you registered for the meeting. Uh, the, the platform has a provision for downloading your contacts. So we'll be able to share the PowerPoint presentation so that you can share with your friends. We have also recorded this session. So as I said, uh, we'll share the recording also uh, to the various email addresses that have been recorded so that uh, uh, you, you go through and also have a YouTube channel, Dr. Rebecca Wambua. If you haven't gone there, please sub subscribe and we'll also share this recording so that many more can be impacted through this message. Some people were asking about stigmatization. That was before Sami's presentation. Uh, I hear those questions. I think those questions have been answered. Uh, the, uh, maybe to the lawyer, James Okeo, uh, there's the issue of privacy of uh, the patient. What about those who are close to, uh, to the patient? Will they be considered to contravene laws regarding privacy? And yet we are aware that when some of the mentally ill patients are, are unwell, they are not uh, mentally stable, so they may not make uh, very good decisions. So what would you say about this? Uh, thank you, Dr. Terry. The, the issue of the privacy, that is something that is of, of great concern. And even when you look at the amendments uh, to the law, the, the act uh, gives those family members the right to make that decision. And they go listing them in an uh, order of priority. They say that an intervention can be made by the father of the mentally ill person, or if that person is unwilling, we go to the next, the spouse, like that, like that. When they take intervention, they cannot be saying to be, uh, to be compromising the privacy rights of this mentally ill pa pa person. So I think that they are, they, are, they are protected by the law. They can move on. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, some of us are asking for contacts of the specialists who we consulted today, all those who made the presentations. I've given my personal number, that's my number. You can call me, then I'll link you uh, to any of the specialists that you'd like to consult. Uh, someone is saying uh, some people are not ready to help those who are mentally ill because they want to take advantage of their property. I think that also happened. So, we should not be ignorant about that, but we are saying uh, those who are mentally ill should be uh, should be given the medication or should be taken uh, for treatment. Uh, one of us is saying, I am depressed and alone. I think maybe Charity, Charity, are you in the house still? If I am depressed and I'm alone in the house, what happens? How do I assist myself? before my friends, or maybe I have no one 
who is close to me to assist. Uh, Professor Charity, are you still there? Oh, she has left. Maybe I can answer okay. that. Yes. Um, I think the first thing to do is at the moment uh, you notice those signs that I was talking about is to literally just go and seek counseling. First, the first step would be go for counseling uh, because sometimes the kind of, because sometimes uh, depression could, people could, sadness could disguise itself in depression. Sometimes um, it could be an issue that if uh, through counseling, uh, you're able to unpack whatever issues that you're facing and then you would immediately get out of it. And sometimes it could be that uh, your situation is so dire that you need medication. So it is not at all instances when you're going through depression that you need medication. So the best, the first step to uh, take is to go, go for counseling so that you can be able to determine whether your issues are manageable, whether there are issues that can easily be unpacked first before you, you know, before you, before you uh, resort to medication. And, and I think in um, most, uh, I'm not a practitioner, but I know that practitioners would tell you that medication is sometimes the last resort, especially for depression. So it could just be that with counseling, you can be able to unpack the many issues that you're going through or the many issues that you might not even be aware of that might be causing you to be in that state. And then now you will be advised whether medication is good uh, or not. And for your own, because I saw someone, just to tie the answer to another question that I saw someone asking, I don't know if it's the same person who asked that question, that what are some of the things that you can do on your own to get out of depression? Uh, number one would be to set a, uh, daily targets for yourself, uh, daily targets of the least minimal of things to achieve. Because I think depression gets worse when you think that you need to continue living the life that you are living before you got into that state of depression. You know, when you expect yourself to be as productive as you were before you, you, before you got into depression, so when on a daily basis you wake up and you say, oh, maybe today I was not an, I was not able to, if you're in school, you say, oh, I was unable to attend lectures. I was unable to complete my assignments. So the more you keep telling yourself, the more you keep realizing that I was unable to achieve what I would normally do when I'm okay, it even gets worse for you. So it might mean that reduce your expectations from uh, having a, 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 an 100% um, productive day to minimal things such as I woke up, you know, like I literally, for me to get out of my most recent depression, depressive episode, and I was advised by my friend who is in the session here, Quinta Kingi, and maybe she might help uh, tackle some of those questions because she's, she's a therapist. She literally helped me and told me, Ruth, sometimes just have a checklist of waking up and ticking and saying, I woke up. That's, that's congratulate yourself for waking up in the first place. Number two, I was able to make my bed. Number three, I was able to, you know, wake up, make my bed tick, brush my teeth tick, have breakfast, do, you know, make lunch, like the smallest of things, have a checklist of the most minute of things and let them guide your perception of how productive your day was so that at the end of the day, you will say, okay, fine. I might not have been able to um, achieve hundred percent productivity, but I was able to achieve these tasks that at this particular time, that I'm going through depression look very difficult. Like I was able to have a three, a three course meal. I was able to have breakfast, lunch and supper. I was able to shower. I was able to make my room. My house is clean. I left the house. So the other thing to do is make sure on a daily basis, you're out of the house. You're either taking a walk, you know, taking a walk, um, exposing yourself to the sun. Uh, those are just simple things that you can do to get yourself out of depression. Make sure on a daily basis, you're having a conversation with someone, you know, it doesn't have to be a long conversation, an extended conversation, but just get to be, have human interaction on a day-to-day -day basis. I have learned in my case of the several times that I've gone through depression that doing those things have helped me. But in the last recourse, if you have to take medication, take your medication on a daily basis. But first step, go and seek um, counseling, go for counseling. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that very informative answer that, that you've given us. And uh, I'm reading some of the comments. I think majority of us 
if not all, are very happy about the presentations and we congratulate all those who have done the presentations are uh, very well done. Uh, we might not continue because of time, but I'd like to say that uh, we have a team that is ready to train you as we've had the schools need training. I've been training in schools also in churches on mental health awareness. So our schools, maybe you are in, you're working in conjunction with a certain school, so we can come there to train churches also, like in our church, SITAM, we've been doing a mental health awareness uh, session, so this can continue in churches, in organizations, as, as we've had, in private organizations, in the government. So this is a serious issue. So this is just the beginning of our conversation and would like you to continue with this conversation, uh, not only for this day, but uh, other days and in different uh, forums. So Martin Wazika says that this needs a holistic approach as we've had. Yes, the prayers are important, but apart from prayers, there is need for counseling, there is need to, to, see, uh, to seek medication. And apart from that, the person needs to be surrounded by a team of people that we have the peer support or we have people in the social network. So our family members, our friends, our neighbors, our relatives, our, our colleagues at work, all of us, are, when one is affected, all of us are also affected. And therefore, if one of us is ailing, let's see how much we can support. And uh, we've had policies are there. I've been wondering whether there are, there are policies that uh, take care of the needs of uh, people who are mentally ill. So we have heard from the lawyer, we've heard from Wairimo, uh, the, the specialist from the Ministry of Health. So policies are there. So there is need for advocacy. There is need for uh, more awareness creation on how we can assist a person suffering, person suffering from uh, mental illnesses. So with that, I wouldn't want to prolong this session any further. I think uh, one of us can end, can end the, uh, the session with a word of prayer. I can see, I can see Caroline Obura. Would you like to close with a word of prayer? Caroline Obura. Actually, let 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 me pray. I if Caroline is not available. Okay. Yes, Wairimo. Okay, Lord, we come before you this evening. We want to thank you for the participants and also the the facilitators. We thank you for the discussion we just had. You know that it will go a wrong way in helping us and ensuring that we learn to live a healthy life and even to help those who are facing health, health issues. Thank you, Jehovah, for enabling us. And thank you also for Dr. Rebecca for overseeing the whole process. We pray that you continue guiding her and increasing her boundaries. Thank you. We thank you for all of us as we break for the night. We pray that you be with us and protect us. Pray this through trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you and Amen. thank you for coming. And Amen. thank you for coming. Please come next time uh, when we call you. Okay. So have a good night. Good night. Good night. Okay. okay. This, this was special. And Welcome. we hope to have uh, good let it be continuous. Good night. Okay, good that's night. good. Night. We'll make it continuous. Thank you. Yeah, let it be continuous. I'm Mary from Embu. Okay, Karibu Sana Mary from Embu. We are thank happy. You. I have really enjoyed. Okay. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for participating. Uh, Sante okay. Sana, God bless you. It was so fulfilling. Yes. And uh, we we have now enough. Amen. And we need more. We need more. God bless you so much. The organizers, we are happy. I'm the senior yeah. university counselor, Jay Quat. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you for hey. joining us all the way from Jay hey, Thank you so much. We are going to invite you there one of these five days. Oh, I will come. I'll surely come. And thank you for attending the session.
Pastor Dorothy from Kijabe, we are happy. I can see you've written there. People from all over Kenya, welcome. Karibuni Thank you, Dr. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Dr. I'm also fine. Okay. I'm Reverend Stanley. Yes, Reverend. Thank you. Yes, Reverend Stanley from Embu. Thank you for attending. And God bless you all. God bless you. Yeah. Send us the presentation, please. Yes, because you ready, I will send the presentation. I am Dr. Josephine Mudami from the University of Nairobi. I wow. can join the session. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank we you. So happy. Yeah. yeah. We are so happy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor. We are grateful. Uh, yes. You want to say hi? I want to say hi. I tried to unmute but was unable. That's why I couldn't share. Uh, Oh, Lady. that is Caroline. I called you to pray. <laughs> uh, I'm Caroline Obura. Yes. I'm at Mango High School. Oh, at Mango. Ah, God bless you. That was good presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for attending the session. Okay, Asante. I can see Stella Osoro. You, are, you can unmute. Proceed, Osoro. Yes. You just get your mic and talk. You are, you are very far from your mic. Is she unmuted? No, she has unmuted, but I think she's not able to We speak. can't hear. We can't hear you, Stella, but we can see you talking. Stella, we, we can't... We can see you talking, but now it okay. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you all. Thank you for coming. And Victor, thank you for hosting us. We are so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. I've seen uh, this was a very, a very important topic for the day. And I think we are Kenya's Kenyans. We need another dimension. Yeah. Yeah, Amira, I can see one of my students here, Amira Jacqueline. Uh, Amira. Okay, maybe she's off her, her, her gadgets. Otherwise, thank you so much. We would wish to finish in the next five seconds. If yeah. you allow us. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, goodbye. Thank you Bye. for coming.